Okay, so um, yeah, welcome everyone. Um, we are excited to have you here to uh, hear an excellent talk by Dr. Jeffrey Kay um, about using technology to advance aging research. Um, this um, event is part of the ISL, the Institute for Successful Longevity Speaker Series. My name is Wally Boot. I'm an associate director with ISL. Uh, we have our director here, Neil Charnas. And I wanted to tell you just briefly about our center, um, our institute, um, before we jump in um, and about this event today. Um, so I would also like to acknowledge the sponsors. ISL would like to offer our thanks to the Claude Pepper Center and the Pepper Institute on Aging Public Policy. Um, for helping to support this event. Um, and there's brochures about all these aging centers at the back of the room if you're interested in learning more. Um, in terms of the Institute for Successful Longevity, I want to tell you briefly about our goals. One, we want to understand the mechanisms of age-associated disorders and functional cognitive declines. And two, we want to do something about that. We want to develop the best holistic interventions to counter these declines. So those are our goals for the Institute for Successful Longevity. Um, we also want this information to reach to, the, to the, for this information to reach people who uh, can make a difference. We want to disseminate this knowledge to community members, to aging adults, and their care partners. And we also want to cultivate the scientific, social, and political leadership on this issue that will engage the nation. So dissemination is also an important part of the institute's mission, and that's what part of part of our dissemination is uh, speaker series, our lecture series, right here as well. So what is successful longevity is a good question. Um, we have um, an example of successful longevity here. Uh, when an individual across the lifespan continues to be able to pursue and hopefully reach their goals, that is successful longevity. When they can accomplish this, uh, they have a high quality of life. Um, there are two approaches that the Institute um, really focuses on. One is planning and prevention to ensure that people in their senior years um, they reach um, their senior years in the best possible physical and mental health. This includes avoiding damage and building up physical and cognitive reserve um, that will serve them in later in life. So planning and prevention are important, but also um, ISL does a lot of research. Um, we have a lot of affiliates who are focused on intervention as well. So not only preventing bad things from happening, but when things happen that are negative, what can we do to restore function um, when impairment um, develops? This includes rehabilitation and compensation. A lot of our research um, in ISL focuses on technological interventions um, to help augment or substitute for declined abilities. Um, I am really uh, pleased today to welcome our uh, distinguished speaker, Dr. Jeffrey Kay. Um, to tell you a little bit about Dr. K, he is the Layton Professor of Neuro uh, Neurology and Biomedical Engineering um, at Oregon Health and Science University. Uh, he received his MD in 1980 from New York Medical College. Um, he directs a number of centers and a number of very large-scale research projects, including um, the NIA Layton Aging and Alzheimer's Disease Research Center, Center Orchitech, um, the Oregon Center for Aging Technology, and orchestrate, these are lovely acronyms. I love uh, orchestrate, especially the Oregon Royal Center for Care Support Translational Research Advantage by Integrated Technology. Um, so a number of large uh, research centers and projects. Um, he is well known for uh, research that focuses on advancing methods to sustain healthy aging and treat dementia. Um, and this work has been facilitated um, by um, an interdisciplinary cadre of colleagues and collaborators, both within um, a, uh, OADRC and Orchitech, as well as many other researchers and collaborators around the world. Um, he has served on many national and international panels and boards in the fields of geriatrics, neurology, and technology. He is listed as one of the best doctors in America. Uh, he has authored over 450 scientific publications and holds several major research grants, I think totaling over uh, 30 million or so dollars, um, probably more than that. And he's pioneered some of his first studies using uh, integrated technology systems to monitor health and wellness of aging adults in the home. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Jeffrey Kay. Sorry, let me 
So you shared first. Hey, there you go. Thank you, Wally, and uh, good afternoon. It's great to be here. Um, first time to Tallahassee, but um, it's great. It's uh, as cold here as in Portland, so I feel right at home. <laughs> actually, it's um, it's actually not as quite as cold, but. Um, so I, I'm going to, uh, th there's two ways to approach giving a, a talk. Well, there's more than two, but I'm going to classify two ways. One is to paint a broad picture or to be more detailed. And I'm probably going to do a bit of both and we'll see how it goes. <laughs> All right, let me just jump in here and I'm sure I can operate the system here. So I'm going to start with, um, a perspective on uh, how uh, healthcare is uh, conducted, the process, and then talk about um, how some transitions or technologies are happening or, or occurring now that hopefully can um, improve our current status quo. And I Hope this is not on an order. It looks like it's almost on an auto system, but we'll see what happens. Um, if you start with at least the, I think this actually has a this picture. This is actually a um, photo sent to me by a daughter of a patient who said there might be a problem at home, um, and it certainly looks that way. The the typical approach though is to say, well, let's make an appointment and you know go to the clinic, and then. You know, we do our assessments. We ask many, many questions. Um, often we'll, you know, we do do an exam. We ask, uh, we, we may have, um, in the case of cognitive problems, do some cognitive testing and order a number of tests, brain imaging, blood tests, uh, which, you know, are um, not fun, but that's part of the way things are done. And we, uh, it's going, and we then take this, um, this idea and try to figure out how that might equate to the real world of what's happening. The whole process is generally um, uh, brief, um, not much time to actually cover all these things. Um, it's stressful. Um, it's actually even stressful for the clinician who realizes that there's somebody, there's people waiting for him in the waiting room. Um, and it's not actually really reflecting uh, the real world. And, you know, we use this term ecologically valid or invalid in this case, because it doesn't reflect what's happening on a day-to-day -day basis. Now, another, another way to approach this, though, is to think about some ways we could improve this um, current paradigm. Before I do that, though, um, I want to kind of dig a little deeper into why this episodic, brief kind of assessment might be problematic, and particularly with regard to um, cognitive, assessing cognitive function. And so what's shown here are a couple of graphs. Um, this is data from the uh, Alzheimer's Disease Neuroimaging Initiative, the longitudinal study has been going on for a couple of decades, I think almost now. Um, looking at the memory tests. So these are the classic memory tests. This is a composite measure. Um, and what you see here going from left to right is the results of uh, a group of individuals who are normal, uh, who have mild cognitive impairment. And then these are people with early Alzheimer's disease. And these spaghetti plots, I mean, that term could be not, it's absolutely obvious. This is a bunch of spaghetti. Um, tells you that it, it's not easy to see the signal for the noise. Um, if you if you imagine it, you know the average is sitting you know somewhere here, somewhere here, maybe. But there's a lot of variability both within the population and actually even within individuals. I mean, there are people who are going up, there are people who are going down. Some are going more 
faster, slower. Um, it's very noisy data. And this is true. This is another standard measure, the CDR, some of the boxes. Um, this is data from a South Korean longitudinal study. Um, this is the primary outcome measure that's being used in all the current um, uh, anti-amyloid clinical trials for Alzheimer's disease. And I, again, I don't need to go on and on. The same principle is shown here. This is even true for other kinds of assessments. So behavioral function. Alzheimer's original case, August Dieter. Um, this is a translated from German uh, from uh, Dr. Alzheimer himself about uh, her having these severe um, agitation or behavioral disturbances. And this is again data this is from a Dutch, a Dutch longitudinal study asking about these various behavioral um, issues and showing again that tremendous variability within individuals and across time as well. So how can we perhaps change that? And the core idea is to go from this kind of brief, episodic, lots of self-report, um, uh, not very uh, stable or reliable kind of data to being able to get the data actually in real life, coming from people's homes or communities um, and capturing, in essence, what they're doing um, or having difficulty doing. And if you can do that, um, it becomes ecologically valid. It represents the true picture of what uh, individuals are uh, doing in their natural environment. So instead of, well, the problems still exist for sure, but then, and the clinic is still not inappropriate for many uh, reasons. In fact, more recently, and certainly since the pandemic, um, telemedicine using, for example, video appointments has become another important tool. Um, unfortunately, it's still episodic and brief and has a lot of the same issues that the in-clinic visit has. But imagine if you could be in the individual's life and capture all these various domains of function that are important for successful aging and do that in the way that is um, actually inherently time stamped so you know that how each of these different functions relate to one another. And, um, and then of course, using the power of the internet, <laughs> being able to integrate that data together and use that as a way to understand what's happening and then make better decisions about what one can do to intervene if necessary. So there are a lot of advantages to being able to do this by using technology. And I'm not, I, you know, I could spend a day on all of these, you know, this is just a list. I'm not gonna go into the details. I'm just gonna um, actually highlight two. Um, and so let me do that. And one actually comes from, uh, uh, comes from the challenge of developing therapies, uh, in particular, developing therapies for uh, Alzheimer's disease. So classically, we develop therapies and require um, thousands of individuals to enter a trial and be followed for long periods of time. And one of the major reasons for that is in order to have enough statistical power to see a change because of the nature of the kind, the way we collect the data and the kind of data that, you know, in a clinic at a baseline, we do these cognitive tests and then we wait. Person comes back six months, year later, do the same measure, but we have all that noise. And so to get the signal from the noise, we have to have large sample sizes. So if you think about, well, what if we didn't do that? What if we could get data all the time or frequently? And so this is data I'm going to show you. Um, it's a, it's um, simulated data in the sense that if you were to take um, a, a classic um, Alzheimer's prevention study, that is people who have mild cognitive impairment haven't progressed fully to uh, more advanced Alzheimer's disease, and you calculated using the conventional measures. So this is the PAC scale, it's a modified PAC scale, but it's a composite measure of uh, memory and executive function and language function tests. 
how many people would you need in these trials? And typically when these calculations are done, it's in the thousands. And that's what you see. So this figure in the middle is the uh, recent report out in the New England Journal of Medicine of the failed solanuzumab anti-amyloid trial, antibody trial. Um, it was actually over four and a half years. Um, it was negative, um, but it took all that time uh, to, to get this, this result. And that result there, those numbers are the differences in the CDR sum of the boxes. Um, so it's not, it's like 0.3. <laughs> um, it, didn't, it didn't reach that level of significance. And even if it did, I, I would argue it's not clear what it means. However, if you were to employ some uh, digital tools and technologies where you could measure function in the home on an everyday basis, such as things like walking speed, and I'll, and I'll be talking a lot more about how this is done, but I just wanna give these examples first. Or how much time every night a person sleeps, or how much computer use they typically have day to day to day. Or even better, if you combine these all together, you can see there's this drastic reduction in the samples needed to conduct these trials. And that's really an important potential advantage um, if nothing else, you, you could do 10 times as more trials <laughs> um, and you might by dumb luck, one of them might actually work. Um, so, um, so that's obviously important, um, but also a different sort of flip side to this is that if you think about it, not all treatments are beneficial and they may even be harmful. So if you have to expose, you might be able to actually expose fewer people to a new therapy. I mentioned you can make more es precise estimates of change in, within an individual. And then finally, particularly in developing drugs, there's this massive expense in launching a trial into its final stages for FDA approval. Billions of dollars eventually are spent. So if you can, at a much earlier stage, make a so-called go, no-go decision, that's a huge advantage. Second uh, uh, advantage or opportunity is really in the ability, to, potential ability to um, reach a wider um, population and uh, reach out to populations that aren't typically involved in studies and trials. Um, the bottom maps are uh, maps, the, the one on the left is where the National Alzheimer's Research Centers are by state. And actually they're all basically located cities where there's universities. Um, the middle is, um, is a map of um, the uh, count by counties uh, where different race and ethnicity groups are uh, more uh, concentrated. And then on the far right is uh, entirely rural counties. So these are places where people are living, but they're quite remote from uh, the rest of the uh, population. And they don't, there's some overlap, but actually they don't really overlap that well. So you can imagine um, just trying to reach out to these different dis disparate communities is difficult. The internet is a natural way, as long as there's access, and that is a potential issue, which is improving. Um, one can begin to now, you, it doesn't matter necessarily where you are, if you can do remote assessment. Okay. How do we get to remote assessment? Well, um, it's not all solved yet. Um, otherwise, I probably wouldn't be here. You, we have this in marvelous research institute here, um, but they're working on it very well, I must say. Um, and in fact, uh, we had to show a couple of instances where, you know, the expression "cold" bringing coals to Newcastle. I'm bringing um, information about usability to uh, Tallahassee. I guess <laughs> different way to look at that analogy. So um, one of the challenges though with technology in general is, um, is its usability um, and um, whether, you know, we can do all sorts of marvelous things, but can people actually um, engage and uh, do, the, do the things that you want them to do or you think they should be doing? This graph here is a, a, a summary of uh, eight 
uh, studies that were done remotely using um, a, a iPhone and, a, and apps uh, from the, the research kit uh, that Apple has supported. Um, and without going into the details, the, the point I'm making here is that if, across all these studies, if you look, look at how often people were actually doing, engaging in the protocol, going onto their phone and doing the things that they were asked to do for all of these studies, there's this rapid drop off in actual usage. And this has been shown in many studies in different places. Another example, this is um, data from the um, uh, Brain Health Registry uh, based out of um, uh, Berkeley um, and administering online the COG state battery every six months without talking about the numbers, specifically just you can look at the graphs and say, yeah, uh, after the first time, people aren't, aren't doing it. And these are people who have, um, uh, you know, mild cognitive impairment or um, subjective cognitive impairment and a number, a smaller number of people who have uh, self-reported Alzheimer's disease. Um, so it's really important to do, um, to understand um, what people are thinking and doing and able to do or perceive that they think they might be able to do. You never know until you actually <laughs> engage people. Um, in our center, we have a cohort called the Right Cohort. Um, and this is an entirely online co cohort that agreed to um, be asked a series of questions actually every two weeks online. And then episodically, they have longer um, uh, queries about topics that are relevant to the research that we do. So as an example, um, we ask people about their attitudes and beliefs about uh, taking online cognitive tests. And one of the challenges about that was, do they really, does a person actually know what we mean when we say that? So we gave them an online cognitive test. The idea was not, we didn't care whether they had any cognitive impairment, I mean, we care. You know, <laughs> in a different way. But uh, for the study, and so this is an example of a grid memory task. Um, there's three simple tasks. It takes less than five minutes. But we gave them that experience. And then we asked them a lot of questions about what they thought about having this kind of experience. And then this is just a table that shows their uh, attitudes about how often they would be uh, willing to take this online test. And, um, and this is relevant to a conversation some of us were having earlier. Um, and the answer, at least in this cohort, was um, one size doesn't fit all. Um, interestingly, the winner was once a week, but clearly there were other individuals who were willing to do it once a day, once a month, um, you know, three, uh, you know, multiple times in a day was um, not very well received. Um, but but the point is, again, that um, you have to know what people are likely to do um, before you have some great you know, technological advance that you think is going to change the world. Another just quick visual about you know, usability is um, we make a lot of assumptions based on uh, social and cultural norms. Um, this is just an uh, interesting, uh, this is an old website that... Um, allowed one to sort of put in what uh, device you had, whether it would fit in a, a pocket or not. Um, this is another couple that I see in, in, see in clinic, but this is doing a virtual visit. Clearly the environment of this virtual visit was very different than the clinic. So there's a lot of promise, uh, a lot of opportunity, but also um, there are um, challenges. There's challenges even just in terms of the immense array of possible technologies that can be used to do assessments um, out in the community or at home. Um, you know, hundreds of apps and wearables and passive kinds of uh, approaches, as well as integrating the whole thing into so-called Internet of Things approach. Um, and so I'm going to next, um, you know, talk more about how to move this, how to move this field forward and how we've tried to um, play a role in that effort. About, um, it was now five years ago, um, 
the NIH and the VA put out an uh, RFA for um, uh, proposals to, and it was called the CARD initiative by the NIH, um, which stands for the Collaborative Aging Researchers and Technology Initiative, CART. And they, maybe we're putting the CART for the worse, but it was a good, I think a good idea. Um, but the, the overall idea was um, that there's perceived to be a lot of promise, but there seemed to be a need to maybe facilitate others to be able to, in the aging community, to use these kinds of approaches in their research um, and to, um, to move the field forward in that way, but do it in a mindful way, generating you know, objective evidence. So we were fortunate to, uh, with other colleagues, um, including Dr. Seja, <laughs> um, uh, win this award and developed, uh, built on a platform of uh, home-based technologies, uh, a system to uh, allow us to go into homes and collect various kinds of data, which I'll get to in a moment. What's shown here is no technology. It's based on the idea of being able to look at different domains of function. Because ultimately, in the end, that's what's important. Technology is not important. It's the what it can measure and what's important to people. Um, if you have pathology in your body and it doesn't affect your function, do you have a disease? This is actually debated. Um, uh, some of us would argue, who cares? You know, I, I'm happy to lose the rest of my hair, but as long as it doesn't affect my function, other than I guess I have to wear, make sure I wear, remember to wear a hat uh, so I don't get sunburned, um, you know, that's important. So it's really function that's important. And so with, with that in mind, the system was designed to be able to look at these buckets of function uh, and have technologies and methodologies that would allow one to assess those domains of function. And I'll give more detailed examples in a moment, uh, but that's what's arrayed now around the home here. Um, so for example, you, know, you can look at cognition by taking an online cognitive test, or you can just look at how an individual typically uses their computer every day. Um, it can be done on different devices, you know, dev using a device of any kind, um, we just had a lot of interesting um, tests here of getting the audio visual to work. Um, and so, you know, that's a, those are cognitive tests, but they're everyday cognitive tests. And they can be measured in many, many ways. Using a car, driving a car, is a cognitive task. Um, and that can be quantitated and measured um, unobtrusively um, using technology. Now, we don't throw away the, you know, the the water, the baby with the bathwater, so to speak. There's still tremendous value in, in other more conventional measures, uh, clinical data, imaging data, you know, body, biofluids, the electronic medical record data, and even external environment data, the weather, uh, climate, environmental conditions. Um, all of this can be integrated, and the system was designed to be uh, able to con uh, integrate that data. It's technology agnostic, so it's not about a particular operating system, a particular device. Um, these are just examples. These are not required devices or approaches. And of course, the data has a whole other story, it has to be securely um, uh, obtained and um, transferred for later analysis. And then one other key feature is technology changes all the time. And there's this there's this phrase called future proofing, which doesn't really exist. <laughs> no one knows what the future may hold, but at least uh, being mindful of the ra rapidity with which technology changes and, um, and trying to um, have a bridge to the past when you're going forward, I think is a very important principle that we've tried to incorporate. I also want to emphasize um, this. This is one thing to, to give a shout out to Thomas Riley in the top, who's the genius behind the scene. That technology is magic, isn't it? Um, I think it was was it um, Alan Kay said that. You know, um, any any uh, a good technology is one that appears like magic. And so, but behind the scene, there's a whole uh, back end system 
it takes a tremendous amount of work to keep maintain and to update and, and to operate. And with, you know, this would be a different talk if I was to go into the details here. But I just want to point out that um, it's not, there's a lot that goes on to get to where um, we need to go. So in the CARD initiative, one of the requirements was um, very importantly to make sure that the systems and the methodologies could be um, conducted in populations that typically have not been involved in actually not just technology research, but in clinical research. So uh, there was a mandate to uh, look at diverse populations. So this included um, a group of older African Americans in Chicago that were participating in the Minority Aging Research Study, the Mars Study, um, a group of uh, veterans, mostly rural residing in the Pacific Northwest, a group of older um, adults living in subsidized Section 202 housing, those were in Portland, and then a group of individuals in Miami or the Miami area um, who were largely uh, Hispanic or Latino. And these just show some of the examples of the Technology, this was designed to be as best as possible, as unobtrusively po as possible. So the circle up here is a passive infrared motion sensor. This is an electron pillbox. There's a watch here, a wearable. Um, this is a bed mat that goes into the mattress to look at nighttime behavior and sleep. This is a, just a contact sensor on your door to help understand coming and going. Um, and I'm not gonna talk about the details of the study other than say that it was extremely important to do this. And a lot was learned about the differences of these in these different populations. Just a very quick example. We did compensate people for their participation. We started out with $50 a month. And then we were told by the low-income housing group that that was too much. And the reason was that um, that would potentially trip some of them over the qualifications for low being low income and they might lose their housing. So we changed it to $49 a month. And, it, and that was that worked out as it turned out. So you learn you, you never know until you do something. It's really a very important principle, isn't it? So some just quick examples of the kinds of things that um, can be done, have been done. Um, in these different domains. So if you think about everyday cognition, um, one can look at computer use. So here I'm showing some data from a study where we looked at time, just simple time on the computer, either time in a, when people were in a computer computing session or the time of day. Um, and this is clearly a very sensitive measure of cognitive decline in people with MCI. Similarly, one can look at uh, some mobility. This is done with passive IR sensors, um, looking at gate speed um, every day and every time a person walks past a set of sensors. So you get dozens and dozens of measurements in a day, thousands in a year. Um, and you can see there's a difference in these mobility patterns in people who have mild cognitive impairment in different stages. Another really important area is socialization. Um, and this can be very grossly measured like looking at time in together, time apart, and time out of the home. Again, just using passive activity motion sensors. And then finally, um, uh, there's a lot of things that can be done at nighttime and around sleep using different methodology. You can use passive IR sensors, you can use a wearable, a bed mat. They all have uh, great potential and specific um, usability under different conditions but they do a very sensitive measures of what's happening at night. And you can even look at couples and their differences. Um, in the clinic, I now, having looked at a lot of this kind of data, I um, have often struck that when uh, a person is um, with dementia is said to be having sleep problems, it's actually the spouse who's having a sleep problem. Uh, but that's for another day. Uh, all remotely acquired data is unsupervised. Um, so you really don't know what's going on. And, and you know, these data streams could be um, affected by many external factors that happen throughout the day and the person's time at home. So what we found over 
many, well now actually a couple of decades was we have to ask people something about what's going on. This is the one obtrusive thing that we found is really necessary. And through a lot of uh, trial and error, we've come to a weekly questionnaire online that's sent through an email link, not through a text. And um, that appears to be the more reliable way of getting approximately 80% adherence week after week after week after week. We have people who've been doing this now for years. Um, these are fundamental questions that are really hard to get at. You can't get at some of them at all with sensors. Um, you have to ask somebody, are you down or blue? Are you lonely? Rate your pain. So you, these are really fundamental. You can imagine if people are in pain, their activity, their sleep, all these things we're measuring with sensing could be affected and you wouldn't know that. So these are very important questions to ask. And you can see here, um, on the, and this can be done on, on any device, it's, it's um, you know, web-based. Um, on the right is just some data from the early pandemic, just kind of showing the effect of, the, that's a major natural experiment, if you will, the effect of external events on these activities. In the low-income housing group, you can see the loneliness going up, uh, this is just self-report week to week. Um, uh, when the state of emergency was announced in Oregon, uh, in the lower panel is the uh, same kind of data in Chicago for the Chicago Mars cohort, looking at step counts. And then we have a colleague, um, Adrian, Adrian Hughes uh, in Minneapolis, Minnesota, um, who has used the same system, but here showing similar data, looking at driving and time on the computer. And, and here actually time on the computer went up, which is perhaps not surprising if you're spending more time at home during the pandemic. Now, the other cool thing about uh, uh, this kind of data is there's a lot of metadata that, that can be very powerful and uh, telling, and you get it for free because it's part of just the uh, capturing of the data. So you can look at how a person um, uh, swipes on a screen. You can look at mouse movements. We've uh, shown, this was actually from Adrian Hughes, the person I just mentioned, uh, that mouse movements are, seem to be different in people who have mild cognitive impairment. Um, of course, you can give them online tests as well, um, not necessarily preferred, but you can do that. But you can look at the features of that testing, um, how long it takes them. It's not just the absolute correct numbers of answers. Um, and it's even, you know, the time of day itself can be very telling in terms of uh, changes in cognitive function. So people with MCI tend to start answering questions online later in the day or later in the week. Even. Um, and then of course, there's this whole rich area of um, when you're having a video online, screen here went temporarily blank, but it's not here. Uh, uh, you can uh, look at um, characteristics of voice um, and language and even um, you know, facial expression and things like that. So there's, that's all this metadata is very uh, rich and, um, and I think it's, a, it's an area that's yet to be fully explored, but it can be very powerful. Um, there's a lot of work that needs to go into validation. And this is a big topic um, and there's all kinds of validation. Um, so there, there's, you know, the basic validation of, um, you know, every time, you know, my watch uh, says I have a step, how, how is it really a step? You know, that, that sort of thing. But then there's also this area of, is, it, is there biological plausibility to the measurement? You know, how does it relate back to, you know, physiologic function or what's happening in the body or the brain? So here's that same computer use, but uh, looking at um, medial temporal lobe atrophy in this same population and showing this very strong correlation with loss of medial temporal lobe volume um, in those who are uh, with decreasing uh, uh, computer use. Um, and I, I have to say, when, when I was shown this by Lisa Silbert, who did this study, I, I joked with her, I said, you must have painted that on because it's almost too good to be true, but it, it, is, it is true. And she promised me she didn't paint it on. 
Um, and then perhaps the ultimate um, uh, clinical pathologic correlation, if you will, is a digital pathologic correlation. So can you actually say that these measurements that we're taking in the community um, every day, do they actually relate to the pathology in the brain? So we've been very fortunate to be following a, a large number of people with these systems in their home who've agreed to donate their brain to us when they die. And so we recently just published this um, data looking at the uh, classic uh, Alzheimer's pathology and looking at it relative to these various um, digital measures. So time on the computer, days with computer use in this case, total sleep time, um, in this case measured with passive sensing, walking speed um, or gait speed, and then time out of home. Uh, and we then even put these together as you as commonly done for functional measures, there's a composite measure that people like. And if you look at that uh, functional measure, it appears to have a correlation with uh, the pathology. Although um, from my point of view, that's it's kind of a bonus, but um, the bottom line is these are measuring real function. Um, and you know whether it's, it's due to the, this pathology or another pathology actually doesn't necessarily matter. Uh, also, uh, just to point out that um, the, the uh, power of time syncing of information. Um, this is one patient's data. This is from a, uh, a study we're doing. Um, I'm also part of a, um, actually I have another, I have another center, I did <laughs> the, the PATS Center, it's a Pacific Aging Cancer Center. So this is a cancer focused aging center that we have at OJSU. And there's a number of people who are in uh, these studies who have, in this case, there's a cohort where they have multiple myeloma. The top myeloma, which unfortunately has this toolbar on the top, uh, but it, those are responses to that weekly questionnaire, just five of them over time. And then um, synced with that are their um, step counts, in this case, measured with a wearable. Uh, they're walking, I'm uh, sorry, their weight, which is a very important measure in people with various cancers. Um, and then a number of sleep measures um, shown on the bottom. Again, the point here is that um, you can see how you can uh, integrate a picture, a very much more uh, holistic picture of what's happening um, on a daily basis over time by being able to combine these data streams. And you know, in a similar way, I think that's um, that's really the it's one of the golden gooses um, is is to be able to um, really predict proactively when people might be getting into trouble. Um, this is one case of an individual who um, was followed in our longitudinal aging normal aging study, starting over here. <laughs> um, just looking at their walking speed. And then um, it started to decline clearly. And this is going back to 2011 and 2012. And then they, they got a diagnosis of Parkinson's disease. They were put on the standard therapy, had some stabilization, maybe a little improvement. And then actually then they, they moved to a um, retirement community. And we were able to actually deploy the same technology into that environment question of whether the changes in the measurements was the new environment or the person, the relative changes were the same. Uh, but you can see we can get this very long-term record of what's happening over time. And you can even drill down to more um, uh, specific time, um, time frames. Um, so this is a different patient who developed Parkinson's disease. Um, and then was put on therapy. On the top is just set counts, and this person looked at with a wearable. But you can also look at more uh, fine grained time intervals. On the bottom panel is looking at their walking speed measured with the passive sensing, and looking at the time of day and where their walking speed um, reached a certain um, uh, threshold, just that scale on the, on the right. Um, and you can see the interesting effect of the treatment 
by hour of the day, uh, which is a, you know, as a physician, this is like pretty, pretty intensive, impressive information to have over time. Okay. Look at how my time is going here. Um, I'm going to blitz through a bunch of examples. Um, and um, hopefully there'll be time at the end and you can, we can come back and I'd be happy to talk about details. But I wanna give a flavor for the research that can be done, is being done using this kind of approach. So um, one study that's uh, been in operation now for the last, I think it's now almost a year, um, is this DETECT AD study. It's a simulated clinical trial to actually see if you know, remember in the beginning I talked about or extolled the virtues of using um, digital cap data capture to improve the conduct of clinical trials in Alzheimer's disease. Well, how you know, can we prove it? And so uh, because unfortunately, because there's no effective therapies, how would you know that this that the that, that the digital measures are sensitive if the treatment is this is null? There'd be no change. I guess you'd say, well, there's no change. Um, but that's a hard thing. So what we did was um, we basically enrolled people who have a, a expensive amyloid PET scan at entry. Um, and those who have amyloid positive scans are considered individuals with taking a placebo. Why? Well, if you're taking a placebo, the, the, uh, the anti-amyloid treatment is supposed to remove your amyloid. And they do actually do that quite well. Um, so this is, would be the placebo group because the amyloid is still there. The treatment group are those who have no amyloid or low levels of amyloid. And then we enroll them, we follow them that way. They actually do take a, a multivitamin once a day to simulate the experience of having to take a pill for a trial. And then they do all the conventional measures that we do in a clinical trial. But they also have a, all that technology in, uh, installed. And we're looking at how, um, if we can actually truly detect these changes earlier and with smaller samples in this study. Another um, example of a, a study and intervention is this series of, of uh, studies uh, that were headed by Hiroko Daj, long-time long -time colleague of mine, um, looking at the power, the potential power of uh, social inter, uh, interaction and improving or increasing the dose, if you will, of social engagement. Um, you can't just go out and tell people, get more friends. <laughs> it's good for you. Um, particularly for those of us who are introverts, that, that would be actually more anxiety provoking. So uh, this study, uh, the idea here was to provide daily, four times a week, daily video chats um, uh, over a six, a six month period um, and to people who were living alone and uh, actually isolated and lonely. And, uh, and this uh, also used some technology, uh, the electron pill box was looking at a functional measure uh, every day. Um, the um, interactions were recorded, the audio, audio and video was recorded for later analysis. And the results of this study um, are, are in, in press, as we say, that's an old term. Um, and uh, they were actually positive. Um, uh, and, and so there, but there's a lot of data uh, also here to look at. And one of the things that uh, was early on looked at was um, the analysis of the voice recording. So these are conversations that are being held every day. And um, just a very early analysis was looking at the proportion of words that the person with biocognitive impairment spoke versus the person who was doing the, you know, heading or sort of facilitating the conversation. And in this analysis, there was more words spoken by the person with MCI on average. And there, there was also even a, a, a content of language analysis. Um, this is very uh, preliminary, but uh, there were certain, seemed to be certain word categories uh, that were used more frequently, including uh, some uh, swear words. Um, these Individuals were not swearing like sailors, or uh, not to cast aspersions about sailors. Um, uh, but there's a lot of work that needs to be done here. But you can, I, I think, you know, what I want to get across is there's an amazing opportunity uh, to really um, you know, go further in how we analyze 
um, changes over time. Another um, kind of intervention is for caregivers. This is work of uh, Allison Lindauer, shown on the screen up there. Um, this is an online caregiver intervention for uh, people or caregivers who are uh, at home with an individual with dementia who has particularly behavioral disturbances um, and looking at um, the effect of this. Um, it's really a um, kind of education counseling program that's conducted online. Um, those actual interfa those interactions are also recorded and for later analysis. Um, and the technology is also in one of the sub-studies for the study installed in people's homes to see if the caregiver uh, is um, getting better sleep, getting out of the home, uh, doing things that hopefully are more um, engaging and positive for their well-being. And then another uh, interesting aspect of the study is because these individuals are reporting every uh, week online about have there been medication changes? Have you gone to the doctor? Um, are you getting more assistance at home? All of those have out-of-pocket costs. And out-of-pocket costs are a huge driver of the cost of dementia care. Um, and it's they're grossly underappreciated and they're hard to measure. Um, so what we've been able to do, this is work at Walt Dawson, another colleague, um, is actually look at those responses week to week to week and then put dollar values on them and show the kinds of um, uh, out-of-pocket expense of caring for somebody at home uh, might entail. Another study uh, is this brilliant study of Raina Croft. Um, it's a program called SHARP. Um, it's based on, um, it's, it's focus is on African-American uh, older adults, um, originally in the Portland community, is actually being expanded into Seattle and Oakland and some other spots. But the basic premise is that individuals walk as triads in the community. Triads was something that Raina said, if it's just two people, it's very easy for one person to say, I don't want to go today, and the other person said, sure, <laughs> let's not go. So triads makes it a little harder. Um, but most important is that um, they walk guided by this app that has been pre-curated um, such that in the community, there are certain areas that are of historical significance or events. And it brings those up, these are called memory markers. And, and when you get to those markers, the triad stops and has a conversation about that. So it's, there's an element of reminiscence therapy here. It's certainly socialization. Um, those conversations are recorded. Um, they actually go into a, um, there's an oral history being created of the community. Uh, so it's actually gives back to the community. There's a lot of really positive things about this project and this program. And again, um, there's a sense that they get the technology in their home to see if this activity program improves their weight, their blood pressure, their sleep, all those things that we hope are actually improved or maintained at least. Now, a lot of what I've been talking about has been the early, um, you know, early changes or MCI and those sorts of things. But there's a tremendous opportunity to um, help individuals who are at late stages of dementia. Um, uh, they are under, um, <laughs> it's not the right word, underhelped. <laughs> They're under, uh, understudied uh, and, and, and the therapies or the treatments to actually help them are just not very good. Um, so, one, and one of the problems or difficulties is how do you know that, you know, measure these changes uh, proactively? So, um, Michael o. Young um, has taken the platform and tuned it for, in this case, to a kind of memory care unit kind of setting. And then looked at activity relative to agitation. And the idea is to detect the agitation, detect whether treatments actually are effective or not. And so what you're seeing here, you don't need statistics, and I love statistics, but you don't need them um, to see that you can, on those agitated nights, define very uh, conservatively that these are nights when their PRN medications were given. 
which is kind of a no-no. Um, so when this is given, it, there probably was a real need for it. Um, versus the um, non-agitated nights. And you can even, you know, you can see where people might have gone. This is again, one person, but there's other data of other patients. But also uh, this people with um, these behavioral symptoms are not limited to um, facilities or institutional settings. Most people are actually at home. So how do you also look at these kinds of behaviors at home? And so what um, Michael has done further here is um, create a, it's essentially an app that looks at these behaviors, these agitated behaviors, um, again, on a weekly basis. And this gets back to the frequency. We don't want to have a poor caregiver who's dealing with somebody who's, you know, they're trying to get them back to bed or, you know, uh, not be upset. And then it's like, oh, um, I just got a text from the uh, research team. They want to know how I'm feeling right now um, every day or, e or every hour. So we, we, again, with a lot of trial and error, we, we got to this weekly kind of assessment, which is definitely better than what currently is available. What's really interesting here, I think, is um, this is just nine patients' home data. Um, is the heterogeneity. It's, it's amazingly heterogeneous in terms of the types of behaviors, when they occur, and their severity. And it really points to the incredible challenge of doing interventions and showing they're effective. It almost implies that you have to have an end of one approach, um, that, that uh, you know, the mean changes are not gonna be of any value almost. So important preliminary or early data on this approach. Now I'm gonna end with uh, some um, other um, Future, future ideas that are, you know, we're, we're currently developing. And when I say we're, I, I'm, uh, unfortunately, I spend too much time as an administrator. And the, this, this is all work of brilliant people that I've been lucky enough to hang out with. Um, so one of those people, persons is, is Chai Wu up in the left, your right hand corner there, um, looking at the idea about, um, habits and, uh, you know, activity patterns that we all have. We're, we are truly um, uh, victims of habit in a way. Um, and so here you're seeing these, these uh, red dots are just showing the same data, but, it, but looked at in different ways. So the, the, on the left is, is what we call, you know, moving about a home and the dwell times that, pe that people spend in these different rooms. And then on the right, it's looking at the same kind of data, but on an average, out, the average hourly room occupancy. So they're, they're, they're complementary, but they're slightly different measures. So you can take that kind of data and look at this in terms of people's habit patterns. I want to go back, though, to um, an early study that uh, was done uh, that was led by Dan Austin, a brilliant young man at the time. Um, who now, of course, works for an uh, internet ad agency creating algorithms, uh, predictive algorithms, so, so that you can shop more. Um, he's a good guy. <laughs> um, but what, what this study was looking at was, um, you know, we all know that, you know, if you look at outside activity, like, what, why is there rush hour? Well, everybody's doing the same thing, and we have these same patterns. But there's very little data, or was at the time, about patterns of behavior within your personal space, you know, essentially within your home. So he initially looked at the, the data we had in terms of whether these patterns of behavior, how predictable they were across individuals versus within individuals. And, um, and, and the bottom line, without going into the details, are some really fascinating looks at things like power laws in terms of predictability um, at the, even at the minute level, um, but basically showed that um, people are very predictable, but within themselves. <laughs> um, and, uh, and there's some interesting corollaries to this subsequently that I'll get to um, about uh, dyads and people living together or not, which I think is again, another 
growth industry or area to look at. So following on this, you know, I already showed you that it's clear that there are characteristic gait speeds of people who have mild cognitive impairment or not. But actually, you know, what, what about in terms of where they're doing, the, where they're moving about and how, you know, how, how much commonality is there in those day-to-day -day variability in that movement in their personal space? And um, so Chow Yi looked at this uh, recently and, and was able to show that, um, that the interdaily um, movement stability, it's a, a measure of that, um, how, how variable essentially day-to-day -day, um, the movement across or within your home is, was clearly uh, different in people with MCI versus those who didn't have MCI. And then even going further, you know, what about specific locations, you know, the, the sort of functional rooms? And here, um, again, kind of showing that um, people with MCI were more likely to um, have more uh, trips to the bathroom, um, to the kitchen, and then you can kind of look at these curves in terms of what time of day those patterns um, would uh, go up or down relative to um, the, you know, literally the diagnosis. And then most recently, this uh, was just published, um, uh, Marine Merling, who's in Amsterdam, uh, further looked at this question of habits and patterns of movement and uh, activity around the home in uh, people who lived alone versus people who didn't. And then people who lived alone with MCI or people who lived alone or lived together with somebody with MCI. So there's four different sort of classes. And um, without again going into too much detail uh, because of time, but we could talk about this later. These are uh, just plots of um, you know time out of home, independent life. Uh, we we call this uh, when people are in separate rooms. Um, there's sort of independent life space activity. Um, kitchen, bathroom, bedroom, so forth. Um, and there are clearly differences depending on where you, who, you, who you're living with uh, in terms of the typical pattern of uh, occupancy and movement. Um, and then I think the last thing I wanted to mention, if I think I've gone over a little bit, but you, you did an introduction, so you gave me the time back, um, <laughs> is um, this, this issue of the environment. So we're talking, you know, we're very interested in this movement around a person's life space and what they're doing typically on any given time. Um, that, if you think about it, is clearly gonna be affected by the environment. One of the questions that we've been asking for years on that 13, you know, that weekly questionnaire is, have you changed your life space essentially? Have you moved your furniture around? So you, you imagine if you're, if you're remotely sensing a pattern and then somebody moves the sofa this way, the patterns changed. You wouldn't know that unless you, so clearly your, your physical environment is gonna have a, play a role. And there are a lot of environmental conditions that are very important. Most recently in the press and in the minds of many of us uh, for different reasons. So in the Pacific Northwest or actually on the West Coast, um, we have now, well, it used to be wildfire season. Unfortunately, it's become a constant <laughs> almost constant thing, but the air quality uh, is, can be significantly affected. Um, this is just showing, this is actually two years ago, the wildfire season, and this is from a couple of weeks in September, and the dots that were changing were going from green air to purple air, which is like hazardous um, in that time period. And the, these large circles, you know, we don't want to show exactly where people live, are people who are in the studies that we have, and those are, reporting out from these uh, sensing stations that are, you know, these publicly available data from these sensing stations out in these communities um, that are closest to where the person lives. And some of these are not that close, which brings up an important issue. Um, I have a different slide here than I thought I had. It doesn't matter. I think I know the material. <laughs> um, so being out of your home is probably a good thing on many levels. Um, at a minimum, um, it makes you physically more active at, at least. Um, 
but maybe it's not so good because you're having a bad, bad air. Um, so um, we looked at this recently um, and, and, we're, and, and actually showed, I don't have the right slide. Yeah, oh, here it is. Um, that um, the correlation between these outdoor air stations and the air quality within um, the home, it correlates, but it's not always very good. Um, it can be actually quite, quite different. Um, and you know, correlation is 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 a relative, so um, you know, you could still be two times higher, but highly correlated. Um, so this brings up the important question about the home environment being really important to know about uh, over time. And it's not like, you know, if you have one bad week, probably we're resilient enough to, but if you are chronically year after year having experiences of these bursts of bad uh, environment, that can be problematic. So Michael, <laughs> Again, she appears here. He's our, he likes the sensing the environment and he's very good at that. Um, uh, looked at, again, this focus on behavioral changes. Um, and th this is actually um, looking at, in this case, apathy, depression, and anxiety um, reported weekly online. Um, and again, that phenomenon of there's tremendous heterogeneity, both in the, the symptoms, the level of severity, and their change over time. Again, these are these are nine individuals. They're 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 um, they're not the, all the same from the other nine. Just happens to be a coincidence. There's nine here. Um, and then on the right are um, several panels of, from the not from these nine individuals' homes, showing um, measurements um, using a uh, environmental sensing device is a commercially available device that looks at light, noise, temperature, humidity, CO2, um, small particles, PM 2.5, and volatile organic compounds in the environment. Same phenomena though, huge variability, huge changes over time. And what we really don't know is, is it, you know, what is important? Maybe none of it's important. Uh, some of it is, um, is it all together important? You know, it's, it, and in fact, the company that manufactures this device, they have a, um, I think, no, it's in a different, different slide, but uh, they, they have a uh, composite, like your, your overall environmental quality measure, but it's a secret as to how they actually compute that. Um, but that's a concept that I think is, uh, is important to, for us to understand as we learn more about the effect of the environment on our daily lives. Last slide. Um, a lot of the technology that I talked about, um, you know, has to be set up at home. Um, and I know this is near and dear to the heart of um, the research groups here. Um, you know, how do people, can these things be set up independently? Do you have to have a research team come to the home and put things together? And um, it used to be, I think that was a yes, but now actually um, through the efforts of uh, Nathaniel Rodriguez up there, um, we've been able to self-deploy the system that is have the couples, it's usually couples um, in, uh, in 70 instances. <laughs> um, and I, you know, and Neil raised his eyebrow when I said that, I raised two eyebrows actually, because I, I actually was quite skeptical but I think again that gets to the bias that we maybe have started have had from the past that like well can people really do this and I think we we you know have to remember now that unfortunately or fortunately depending on how you look at people ha just have to rely on technology for many things um, and so they're probably becoming more accustomed to having to set things up and um, and we do have online tutorials and these little YouTube videos. It's like, you know, if you want to bake a cake or a pie, there's like a thousand little videos of exactly how to do it. So we have the same kind of videos that people can access. We have online uh, actual direct human support and things like that to help. But I think, again, this is going to be very important to further work on.
because if you want to have this apply to the wider community and and that's the power of the internet well we need to be able to have the sensing devices and technologies um, available uh, in an easy way that doesn't require you know myself or a team to go to the home we like going to the home people are very nice they sometimes they make us cookies um, but it has to be something that can be self-deployed. So I think, yeah, with that, um, I, so this is, a, I call this the ecosystem. Uh, we have a lot of people who have been using this um, platform, not necessarily the whole thing. I mean, we call it the full metal jacket. I mean, it's, it's really the right tools for the, the project or the, the research that's being done. Um, but we've been very fortunate to have uh, a lot of colleagues across the country. And actually there's a project in France. Um, we have a, a, some great Canadian collaborators. Um, and I put in yellow, um, um, <laughs> yeah. Um, so hopefully um, there'll be more <laughs> interaction as well in Florida. Um, so with that, I'm going to end and say thank you and let's collaborate. Thank you, uh, Dr. K.